The 1843 Charles Dickens novella, A Christmas Carol, is a genuine classic still reverberating through culture almost two centuries later now. The story of cruel and greedy Ebenezer Scrooge being visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present and future, and through these journeys being transformed into a kinder and more generous man, well it's a story resonant enough to fuel countless adaptations. A lot of these adaptations are comedic, and virtually all of them are sweet. So this 2019 version, three one hour long episodes from Stephen Knight and starring Guy Pearce as Scrooge, well it really stands out. Because this is a disarmingly dark version of the story, a decidedly strange take, an adaptation serious to the point of absurdity. Stephen Knight, yes the creator of Peaky Blinders, Stephen Knight interrogates Scrooge and Christmas itself more philosophically than anything else. A Christmas story perhaps more about institutions than traditions. Now one could read the original Dickens tale in half, maybe even a third of the time it would take to watch this series. So what does it offer? Why are the three of us, myself Neo from Australia, Ingiga from England, and Tom Tit from Australia as well, why are the three of us so raring to talk about it? Well guys, what makes this series so special? I think it's an interesting and compelling example of a the, the BBC being involved with yet another contemporary reimagining of a classic that takes some risks to be a bit iconoclastic and crucially in this case to update it a bit in line with some of the more perhaps anti-capitalistic sentiments that are more popular in pop culture right now just the ones that are floating around at this moment in history for me i think it's a really interesting sort of rebuke of the original novella or maybe a bit of an elaboration on it because um there is some reverence for it as well as sort of uh, a response to it um i think that basically that like in our stories culture culturally we have a tendency to sort of get so swept up in um like monsters and the things that monsters do and eventually it gets to a point where you sort of forget about um you know the people affected by them um and we also have a tendency to sort of we become obsessed with the ideas that you can do horrible things so long as you um feel really bad about it afterwards and make some gesture to counteract it, you know, like three Hail Marys or something. And we don't afford enough time to the possibility that maybe you just shouldn't be a monster in the first place. Um, you know, feel sorry about it before you do it and then don't do it. Um, because like the sort of systematic abuse and exploitation, it creates um, scars that don't heal and they ripple and reverberate across time. And that's sort of like what this version of A Christmas Carol is concerned with and about. And um yeah, it's it's very like intensely political in that sense, and it's why I found it so refreshing when I watched it last Christmas. Yeah, that question of forgiveness raises the interesting point that this is an adaptation of a Christmas Carol that you can kind of spoil, which is extremely uncharacteristic for adaptions of a Christmas Carol. But it's not quite the ending we're used to, is it? No, no, it isn't. Are we good to sort of talk talk specific plot details and stuff like? spoiler wise i suppose at this point yeah 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 so fr fr from this point on we will be talking uh in spoilers as much as we can about this adaptation of a christmas carol go and watch it wherever it's available which i don't know the answer to because it's not on blu-ray <laughs> on that point um i checked the other day and is is actually on iplayer in the uk at the moment it says available for another month at least so any uk Excellent. listeners go and jump on that right now interestingly um while in the uk well, in the UK, it transmitted as three episodes on separate nights. In America, it was on FX as this one three-hour blocks with um, ad, ad breaks edited in at some very uh, arresting uh, locations, I, I found. It, it's interesting kind of seeing how it's just a little bit different in these two versions. But anyway, sorry, that's completely uh, off the point. Um, what I was going to say about the ending being different, the real, um, perhaps the key is that in this version the redemption that Scrooge usually gets in the other versions, he outright turns down, in a way. We get a completely different version of his uh, epiphany, so to speak. Your £500 will be welcome, but you will not buy forgiveness. Nor shall forgiveness ever be earned, nor expected or wanted. My business now is the future. I will just be the best I can be. Yes, it's interesting to me because... 
he'd been kind of playing to the ending we expected all the way through. He has these quotes, like the big one is, of course, this explains me, this excuses me, but he has other ways where he like contextualizes the story as, oh, this is progress for me, right? This is my development. Like he's constantly trying to narrativize it into this way where we'd expect it to be, oh, he gets redeemed, it's a lovely story, everything's concluded and fulfilled, but of course it's not. What happened to me here at this school? This this excuses me, this explains me. And because it's all in the past, nothing can be done to remedy it. So you require more than a mincing knife from warm gravy to soften your heart. But that moment in the second episode where after all the intensely dark revelations, his response is to say, this excuses, you know, this rationalizes my evil. That's such a, it's such a fascinating point of his character, but it's also this really meta point on stories like this, where you do the dark backstory of someone and then, ooh, you know, then oh, we understand, then we stand, you know, then, <laughs> then we're kind of on their side, but it doesn't wash out anything that he did. And he did a lot of evil. It's a very, um, sort of like post Alan Moore thing to have characters, um, be aware of and comment on their, what they represent within the confines of their own story. And, um, yeah, I love the way Scrooge is just an absolute master at building up these elaborate mental worlds where he's able to justify everything he does, you know? Um, and yeah, by the end he uses that logic to sort of turn down his own redemption and like, uh, we can't help but agree with him that he probably doesn't deserve that or almost certainly doesn't deserve that. Um, but yeah, this Scrooge is like, he's, he's clever enough to understand that he is so evil that a redemption wouldn't really fix anything. Um, but the whole, the whole like element of him, um, coming up with ways where what he does is okay. It's, it's very like psychologically realistic and the psychological realism is probably one of the biggest additions to, um, the story that Stephen Knight's made is that like, we see why Scrooge is the way he is and we see him exhibiting lots of unusual behaviors, which we've never really seen ascribed to Scrooge before, um, sort of related to trauma and, um, things like that. He's a really well sketched personality. Like I'm drawn to how he mathematically obsesses over everything and his obsession with rules and what seems irrational to him. And there's that great scene in the first episode where he's in like this chaotic flurry of categorizing all the noise he can hear in the street and trying to write it down and all sort it out in his mind. It's this, his obsessiveness and his kind of fixations are a really shaded way to portray the character. What did you guys think? I think if he lived in the present day, he would use Reddit. I think he's a perfect <laughs> encapsulation of that modern idea of the beat boop logician, you know, superior intellect. I am the, the enlightened atheist. I am the, uh, uh, you know, rather than these ridiculous oh, slash, I am very smart. Very, yeah, yeah, I am very smart. Exactly, exactly. And that's another thing that kind of makes it feel quite timely and a, a bit like it's speaking to the present day because this sort of person is still very much around in society and just getting on everyone's nerves well it's something i love with that is his big supervillain speech in the second episode when he's done you know his darkest act is he's saying i'm a man of reason a scientist i like to conduct experiments and so all the ways he fashions himself as a scientist in the first two episodes feel so evil and terrible and they are but then in the third episode where the ghost of christmas present is his beloved sister and we learn that she was kind of a scientist and it's something he found really endearing and he loved. It takes on this kind of sad bent to me because then it's just, in a way, it's clearly more of him just patterning himself after, you know, one of the few people he actually loved and someone he looked up to because he said, you know, he admired her smarts and how she was a show off about it and everything. So it's just more of that depth to the character that even the peak, like, insult here logic of himself isn't just a random thing. It's drawn out of these very understandable bits of his past. And the other layer to it is that he like prides himself on being this completely rational logician, but um, he's also totally ruled by like magical thinking. I mean, the very first thing we see him do is he attributes a smudge um, on his suit or whatever to an act of kindness. And like, that's yeah. completely irrational. Like it could have been any of the first three lumps of coal and, um, yeah, like like the ghosts basically say he's swapped out um, his faith in like the stories of the Arabian Nights and he's just replaced that with a completely different kind of slavery. Like he's completely enslaved to the idea of numbers and statistics um, to a degree which doesn't make any sense. And like he, 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 it's not clear what counting the number of wheel turns of the, the people outside is going to achieve, but he does it anyway. 
Um, and that totally doesn't square with his, yeah, his pseudo, pseudo intellectual, um, pretensions for complete rationality and objectivity. It's all completely based on emotion and the omnipotence of thought. And yeah, he's just a complete mess basically. And again, very psychologically realistic. Yeah. That's very true to life. Pretty much true of pretty much any person who puts that amount of fetishistic uh, importance on the idea of numbers and facts and logic and capitalism and economics and stuff you know you you dig deep enough and you will hit ultimately that reliance on yeah. complete magical thinking the fact that all of it is on a foundation of bullshit basically yeah the, the basis of it has to be exceptionalism where your worldview is correct and the others aren't and therefore all the incorrect things in the world are stemming from grading against your worldview but it all relies on that extremely closed-minded unintelligent view of whatever my ideology is it's actually correct all the others are incorrect but i'm completely correct what a great coincidence that is and so many of his like gotcha moments for the confrontation in bob cratchit and in the office which is like a really long scene with so many um dramatic turns it's really amazing but um all of scrooge's gotcha moments in that are basically just like Hmm, I'm being very annoying and you're very annoyed at me. Um, and yet it's Christmas. So <laughs> that must be Christmas's fault or <laughs> just like these complete logical, um, sort of circular nonsense. Um, and yeah, it's like he assumes that he's just a casual observer. Like the fact that you hate me must mean that, um, you're a beast and I'm not a beast. <laughs> um, he never counts himself as a determining factor in like what his worldview is. Um, yeah, that whole office scene is really incredible in how many turns and twists it takes. And it's just, I think it represents another thing that's just great about the adaptation in general is that it allows us so much time to delve into stuff like what's it like in Scrooge's office during the day. And and, and I think the fact that we get to explore that on such a, a deep level and also we get to see obviously all the uh, negative impacts is that Scrooge and Marley's business had on the world. I think it just makes the whole story feel so rich in ways that you wouldn't get if it was just uh, condensed down to one feature length. Yeah, and I think that like A Christmas Carol has been restaged so many times that whenever Scrooge acts antisocial in a more traditional version of the story, it's like the really Dickensian dialogue is so it's pleasant to listen to. So um <laughs> the element of actually hating Scrooge has been sort of diluted a bit, you know, not that I'm faulting the great sort of Dickens dialogue in that novella, but um, what's been recaptured in the, this Stephen Knight's version is just, you absolutely just want to slap Scrooge. He's so like, um, the way he acts like he's above it all and the way he thinks he's playing 4D chess with Cratchit. But, and the other great element is that Cratchit isn't really having a bar of it. Like he can see right through Scrooge's bullshit. Um, and you know, the very fact that he tolerates Scrooge kind of proves that like Lottie says, um, it, like the whole system is 50% contingent on the presence of love which so it's like the the way lottie shows the the value of love in the system of um like exploitation it's like even according to scrooge's own stated worldview um his values don't make any sense it's like a really rigorous script in that sort of way on the topic of making scrooge really hateable i think the most unnerving scene in the whole three hours i think for me has to be in the second episode when he is proposing the terms of his horrible deal to Mary and explaining himself that, you know, I'm, I'm conducting an experiment in the price of uh, human price of love or virtue rather. And he's just sitting there just utterly like, skin crawlingly repulsive the way that he, you know, his face is almost like a mask. And interestingly, um, Guy Pierce's performance in that scene, or rather the two performances, because there's Scrooge from seven years ago and Scrooge in the present day. The Scrooge from seven years ago is just really, really scary and just freaky. Whereas the Scrooge that we're following for most of the show, the present day Scrooge who's been taken on this uh, journey, he's almost a bit, um, a bit bumbling in comparison in the way that he's constantly kind of whining at the spirits and being a bit quippy and sniffy. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. He's sort of, um, he, he comes across really, I think we see his patheticness on display a great deal. The way he perks up every, every time Mary, um, tells a lie or she just references telling her husband, the way like a jolt of, you know, recognition and happiness goes through his body, his seven years ago form. It's just disgusting. There's so many great, like, weaselly Scrooge moments, like when he's, um, Marley is, or the ghost of Christmas past is taking him to account for all his, like, 
uh, properties and mines and stuff. And he's just like, no, those were subcontracts. Like, <laughs> yeah, I it's love not that my one. fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's specifically when we're getting more into the colonial ones. They reference uh, Bombay in Honduras, um, the subcontracts, and the way he's just able to dismiss it completely. Uh, even at the end when he, like, says, well, I would have used better timber, you know, in the mine in Wales, so all those ponies wouldn't have died. Like, yeah, that's great, but, we, you know, we never get the grand moment where he, like, says, and I've learned, you know, how colonization is wrong. I've learned how doing business this way is wrong. It's I love how psychologically true and institutionally true the series is like we get this focus on the exploitation of workers and animals and like uh how these people should be held culpable and accountable but it doesn't go into like this absurd fantasy land like the regular novella or adaptions do where scrooge gets good and therefore everything is good because in here you know what's going to happen even if scrooge turns well the best he can do is either close his business like he does or redirect it to you know, some kind of revolutionary efforts. And even in this, we get um, revolutionists stayed by love. You know, his sister explains to him. So I love in that way how the whole story is kind of inert. Like it's this one man just kind of shuts himself down rather than revolutionizes everything, anything. Yeah, it's like um, Dickens was never going to sort of address the colonialist um, aspects of people mm. like Scrooge in the novella. Um, just partially because of his own worldview and partially because of the time it was written, which is why I find it so absurd. People like, um, chastising this new version for going or being too real, <laughs> being too grim, because like, of course those things wouldn't be in the, the 19th century novel, you know, it's like, this is the way to address this, um, today. Yeah. Uh, what it, it, yeah. it reminds me tremendously of Stephen Moffat's. 2020 Dracula series, which we've also discussed in that it does something very true to the novel by kind of transposing the effect the original story would have had on the audience, you know, of the time, you know, many, many, many years ago. Like in terms of Dracula, it's fiddling with the setting to give the effect of immediacy that readers of the novel would have gotten the time. And here it's bringing things like, uh, you know, sexual harassment by workplace bosses with way too much power into the fore, which is something that obviously plays uh, this day in a much more arresting way, um, simply because of the media attention and more importance given to it than would have been in, in Dickens' time. Uh, but in Dickens' time, you know, aspects of the novella would have rung much more, much more uh, immediate back then. But to the but when we it, when we see a Christmas Carol now, or when we read it now, it feels twee or it feels yeah toothless because if nothing else we've seen the story you know dozens of times done the same way even if we've it's not it done with muppets exactly exactly yeah so if you want this to not just feel like a fairy tale and a fairy tale version of this is fine it's a very enjoyable story but if you want to really get to perhaps the heart or the immediacy of what it might have been like in dickens time i think this is absolutely what you do you have to tie it into concerns in the modern day still set in the past period like that's completely fine where it's set but making it arresting to people in 2019, in 2020 and onwards. I think that was absolutely the true way to adapt the novella in a certain sense, like Dracula. Uh, and that's something I really love about this kind of trend of adaptions that look at how can we transpose the effects of this work into a way that adapts it really truthfully, but not, uh, not in a literal way, but in a way that gets the vibe of the original story into the audience of today. I love that. I think it's fantastic. I'm not sure I'd agree that like this version is um, faithful to the spirit of the original, mm. um, like to a full extent, because Dickens, um, I'm not interested in cancelling Dickens right now, I must <laughs> stress that, but Dickens is um, very much a man of his time and he had this really frustrating tendency to undermine his otherwise very well articulated social critiques with just completely nonsensical happy endings. Um, and he also had a tendency to sort of focus his critiques basically on scapegoats. Um, and in his real life, that included mm. Jewish people, among other things. Um, so I think that the new version is sort of in a small way subverting the type of stories that Dickens no, would yeah, often no, tell. I see what you mean. Basically following, yeah, following that to its conclusion. Um, so it, I think it is quite a subversive take. Oh, honestly. yeah, yeah. And that's a and that's a good thing, <laughs> you know. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I, 
I think in that sense, what I like is how it retains the kind of, I think the novella has this kind of biblical sense of how the moral lesson kind of unfurls as it goes on, this kind of methodical sense of to how it's, uh, how, it, how it progresses with Scrooge that I like. And I feel that here, but in the subversive way, I guess what it does is it captures the zeitgeist of now, uh, where the original novella kind of, if captured is the right word, maybe cohered the traditions of Christmas, which is what, you know, it did in a, in a real way, kind of formalized the um, developing traditions of Christmas at the time it came out. So maybe that's the more sense in which it's faithful and that it's obviously, you know, exploiting workers, sexual harassment, um, this kind of reassessment of what do people in this position, like, you know, billionaires who repent or work or bosses who repent, what, 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 what do we, what do do we actually give them? I think that's capturing a zeitgeist, uh, has nothing to do with Christmas, you know, in the sense that Dickens did, but I like that it's capturing the time. So maybe that's the point yeah. I would retreat to. I, mean, I, th- I think on the topic of capturing the zeitgeist, I think the, 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 the bits that have to be thought about the most here is when we get two scenes of, um, Marley's and Scrooge's graves being pissed on by a worker who despises <laughs> them, and that, and the fact that it op- that opens the show, you know, you skin filled or bastard pissing on the grave, like that. The fact that it's willing to take this viewpoint of just that really burning working class rage at the uh, at Scrooge and Marley, and present that in a a non filtered way, a way that is not sanitized per se, but but that is that is suitably baleful for the things that they've done. I think that really, that sums up how it's sort of um, portraying more of a modern zeitgeist and willingness to sympathise with that uh, sort of underclass and that kind of underdog sort of anger at the higher levels of uh, society. And also it's just very funny as well. It is very funny. Um, 19th century, it's like rapid industrialization was still kind of new. As opposed to now, where it's like, how many centuries has it been? And it's um, some, like, this this miniseries is so furious with just, like, the, how are we still doing this? Um, Mm. And you just look at, like, the way the ghost of Christmas past is represented in this. I mean, normally that ghost is, like, a very fey um, sort of ethereal, like a candle with a face or something. Um, Here it's, like, absolute bruiser Andy Serkis, and he's just, like, it's got a serious bone to pick and it's like of course like the past is where all these atrocities um went down the past is the scene of the crime so why wouldn't the ghost of christmas past be equally bitter and scornful rather than the sort of romanticized version which may have been scrooge's past because you know that's what the novella is it's really focusing on scrooge as a man and um basically he should stop being a grump um he's not embracing the spirit of christmas and this version, it's like, he's not a grump, he's a killer. Like, he's responsible for the deaths of hundreds, probably, thousands. Yeah, yeah. those scenes where we get those almost uh, Chernobyl-style explorations of the disaster scenes that were his collapsing uh, workplaces, uh, uh, like uh, those are really key, I think, just... And that's another way in which this is doing stuff that other adaptations just can't do, is just getting an insight into the sheer horror and the 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 just the the sheer collateral grimness and damage that has that people like Scrooge perpetrate i mean it's 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 and again this is it's the zeitgeist thing isn't it because it's something that's in the news constantly this idea of workers being you know just suffering and under insane conditions that are being brought to light it's just it, i i love those scenes i think it's fantastic also on the topic of Christmas past, I love I like how they introduce him in that field of Christmas trees and Christmas presents that he's throwing on a fire. I found something quite fun about that. It's very heavy metal in- imagery, really. Mm. Almost like a, an inverted Santa Claus. Yeah, it's very <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, and like the sort of industrial like music video hellscape that Marley wakes <laughs> up in, I think is really really great. Something I love with the uh, workplace collapse scene, the Welsh mine collapse scene, is the ponies are a really important part of it. So there were 17 ponies that died uh, because Scrooge and Marley didn't let more timber be used to um, reinforce the roof. Uh, Scrooge is really moved by this because he has a connection to animals. Uh, You know, he loved a mouse. That was his Christmas pet uh, when he was a child and his father killed it and that traumatized him and taught him, you know, never bestow anything upon something which can't give profit to you and so on and so on. So he's always had a connection with animals. He loves the animals in the Alibaba stories. But I love how we get this two-dimensionality to it because 
Uh, and he gets called out on this. He's sympathizing and loving the animals um, far more. Well, he doesn't give any, you know, real credence to the workers at first. It's just the animals he can focus on. And then we get, you know, he loves Alibaba so much. And then we hear about how, you know, in all these other far off lands, far away from England, that he subcontracts out and he screws over, you know, with this with the same uh, kind of workplace um, issues that he did with the mine. It's like this two dimensionality to him where you might treasure something but on the other side of the coin, we can see how it's still just a reflection of his kind of moral apathy or his or his lack of mora- morality at all. I really like that. In s- so many other Christmas Carol stories, I could see this trait of, oh, he loves animals, just being like, an, ooh, ooh, he's not too bad. We can kind of stand screwed. But I love in this, it's also a representation of his kind of badness in a way because it makes him even more inhumane that he's capable of, you know, c- connecting with something, a pony or a mouse, but he's not capable of connecting that to actual human beings. Yeah. And um, he talks a lot of game about, like, the human beast, but he has no idea what a beast is. Um, you know, he, he loves these sort of benign animals. And he, when he talks about a human being being a beast, he thinks it's like a savage thing. But um, that's the thing about the character is that, like, he only loves abstract ideas, um, whether it's, like, the stories or the numbers. And that's why I think that, like, with the Mary Cratchit um, sort of abusing scene, I think it was the right choice to have Scrooge not like not go further with the act oh, because um, yeah. he will only he will do that just for the abstract sort of what it represents yeah. for him. And the point is that that's just as bad. Like it's still abuse, yeah. but um, he yeah he only does it just for the abstraction of it. The animal thing is so true to life as well because it's just it's it's a thing. There are people who honest to god care more about you know like a, a dog or whatever than than countless people suffering being exploited and dying it, it, yep. it's it's a way in which it's actually because animals don't exactly trouble us with the complications that humans do it's easier to bestow compassion and mercy and love and, and praise on them whereas if you know for a human it's just it yeah, so people tend to take the easy way out, perhaps. Mm. I'm not saying he shouldn't care about... Oh, yeah, the, uh, yeah. It's not that he shouldn't care about the mouse, it's that he should care about yeah, the children yeah. as well as the child mouse. Yeah. Also on the subject of animals, I love the imagery of the camels in the snow. The yeah. whole um, the whole fantasy kind of mindscape, mind robber, uh, sort of reality-bending style that gets introduced when Alibaba comes into the picture and we start seeing the Christmas past spirit uh, start creating this um, malleable reality around Scrooge's memories. That whole bit's really enchanting. They, they really um, they really lent into it and just going all out with the visual tricks. It's the, the film hat that creates projections. It's really yeah. visually sumptuous. That whole middle episode is quite a feast. It has so much room to breathe as well. Like we spent so much time in the office and then in Scrooge's house. And then, yeah, like there's so much time spent just watching them ride the camels. And some people might call it like languorous. I think it was just had a lot of room to breathe and it really enhanced the atmosphere. And it was really sumptuous and very painterly, the directorial style as well. It was just like such a treat to look at. It's interesting. They spend more than an entire hour on the the one spirit the ghost of christmas past and present and future both squeezed into the last episode but i suppose the way that's negotiated is that the through line with um present and future is kept fairly tight on the cratchit situation and uh like the 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 stuff from the the work the the mines and stuff the the people who died so it's it doesn't feel squished like the the thematic concerns are all there yeah, the disproportionate time given to the Ghost of Christmas Past, it felt almost deliberate to me. Like, yeah, I, I, I counted it out and past gets um, an hour and two minutes, roughly. Present gets 20 minutes, future gets 13 minutes. So it's, like, compressed. It gets more quick as it goes down. And um, I also think that, like, because um, the, it's the idea that the past is, like, it's what actually happened. It's not an abstracted idea of a man's life, like... The future scenes in the novella, it's going to sound like I'm really trashing it. <laughs> I, I honestly enjoy reading it. But um, the future scenes in the novella, they're all quite sort of based on just Scrooge's pride. And it's like, oh, his, all his possessions are getting sold for cheap to a fence. <laughs> and it's like, well, doesn't that kind of validate his entire worldview? Yeah. Like, yeah. it doesn't really matter what arbitrary value is ascribed to his belongings. Um, and here, like, so much emphasis is placed on the actual concrete things that he did and um, and also it's just the fact that Scrooge has so much more past than he does future. I mean, he's an old man. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's not long for this world, I don't think. The complaint, because it is a somewhat common complaint about the miniseries that 
oh, the pacing was shot because, look, they give so much time to past and a little to present and future. Like, I get this three episodes, at least in one transmission of the story, and there's three ghosts, so I get the kind of intuitive one ghost, one hour. But why? Like, <laughs> why does it actually have to be that right. way? I don't understand, like... That's that's not really saying anything. That's just saying there's three things of this, there's three things of this. It's actually kind of Scrooge esque, you know. I'm yeah. I'm more for the revolutionary uh, mathematics of of Cratchit. I don't see why, because for the reasons you state, yeah, it makes a lot more sense to dwell on the past, which is actual character enrichment. What like what we get in the future here with Tiny Tim possibly dying in that timeline? Would we want that stretch to an hour? What does that really do besides wallow in the sadism of going, oh no, you know, after? We get that as such an arresting shot of, like, the ceiling above Scrooge's head being the ice yeah. tiny Tim falls through. In that, you know, shot, we get so much told. We don't need an hour lingering on this, but we do need an hour to explain Scrooge because he's a really complicated character. Tiny Tim being bad, Tiny Tim dying being bad doesn't need, you know, an hour to morally explicate and, and step us through that process. I, I don't think Three Ghosts uh, needs an equal time at all. I like how they did it. I think it made sense. I thought you were about to condemn Tiny, Tiny Tim for a second, and I was really looking forward to that. <laughs> Tiny Tim vibes. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's that thing of, like, needing the three ghosts to have equal screen time. It's that thing of A Christmas Carol becoming just ritualized until it's yeah, sort of yeah. lost some of its meaning. It's, it's like something you do over and over again. And, and when Scrooge says, bah humbug, you stand up and clap. <laughs> um, you know, it's like that thing where... Um, Scrooge, before he is redeemed, you take as much pleasure in seeing him be evil Um and that's not right. That's not the way it should be. Um, mm. And this, yeah, again, goes does some work to correct that. See, that structure that you mentioned with um, there being less and less uh, screen time for each ghost as we go along in the future, it gets the shortest. I think that reflects um, the paring down, so to speak, of the motivations that um, of the motivations that Scrooge has at the climax. Because when it comes to Scrooge's final uh, proclamation, decision, whatever, when he rejects the idea of redemption for himself literally all he wants is just a, an opportunity to save tiny tim right so in, in that sense the fact that all of the fluff and bullshit is put out the way and the future segment is focused really just tightly on tiny tim and scrooge is you know sudden like oh my god like okay i actually don't care about myself anymore i just want to i just want to save this kid so the fact that i so i think um kind of trimming it down reflects how the fluff is sort of being trimmed out of scrooge's motivation if that makes any sense, it's like the the sort of personal um, selfish concerns about oh my pride and so on, like all of that in this adaptation is being sort of sh shoved out the way because mm. Scrooge knows that he yeah. isn't really necessarily that uh, able to change deep down, but he, you know he gets to the more practical concerns, which is he wants to save someone else's life. It's like his his worldview and his rationalization have become less and less tenable as the story goes on. So basically, he has less to do. So I think it it naturally stems from that that the the future and present segments would have less screen time compared to the past, and also like not a second of that screen time is wasted. You know, it's all very um, relevant to yeah. What do we actually do about Tiny Tim and like how do we remember the people who were killed in the mine? And, yeah, not a second of it is extraneous or yeah. He say, he he literally says, given the time again, I would not be myself. So yeah, the excesses of how the novella does the ghost of future stuff would just feel so backward just like indulging and dwelling in in his character in that way um i feel like we've got to talk about mary cratchit because yeah. the choices made with her not just with um the the circumstances of her deal with scrooge but also um how she's uh deployed at the very end and the implications there that that's one of the other big swings i guess that's taken in this mm. adaptation what, what do you guys think of that whole thing i i i've well, there's a few bits to that. The the there's the actual uh, can we call it the Deadpool moment at the end where she looks by the camera. There's we that. absolutely cannot. <laughs> there's that moment. Um, there's also the thing in the second episode after the um, you know, dancing around sexual assault scene where he makes a strip and talk about our intercourse, um, which he doesn't do because, as he says, he's not interested in that thing anymore. Presumably after whatever happened with the mysterious Elizabeth that we see through the Top Hat film mentioned earlier. Anyway, so we have that moment after she leaves where she like says, you know, I have the power of a woman, you know, and so help me if I can call the spirits down on you, I will. And that's that. And then at the end of the final episode, we have her turn to look at the camera 
He also thanks her in a, a way for kind of calling the spirits on it. And she says, spirits, we still have much to do. And then she looks at the viewer. I think these are kind of separate things. Um, the Deadpool shot, I'm actually fine with. Uh, because, you know, ghosts, we still have much to do looking at the viewer. It's like a moral, oh, there's lots of people still bad who rationalize their badness in Scrooge-esque ways or whatever. You should probably stop that call to action. That's fine with me. It's a little bit pat. It's also a little uh, bit- it's a it's a little bit like you want more of the ghost you want more of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Well, it's us, you know, like yeah, we yeah. take the baton and yeah, continue. I the think work. that I think that serves a storytelling function. That makes sense to me. However, the moment where she's like, "I'm a woman," you know, I can call the spirits on you in episode two. That doesn't work for me so much. Um, not because I don't love Mary, and not because I don't think it's cool that she could like do that. I do. But I think it's kind of more of a power fantasy thing that, you know, I'm in such a bad situation, but by virtue of me being beset upon or by virtue of me being a woman, I have this power. I don't feel like it's the kind of magical realism that the rest of the series is engaging in. And so it kind of grates at me a little bit just because I think it kind of pulls me out of the terrible reality of her and the other Cratchit situation. This idea that she has the power to do such a thing, it untethers me a teeny bit from the Cratchit situation. And so I don't like that so much, but I do like the look to the camera and like the imploring the viewer to, you know, go on the next ghostly journey. I do like that. So I think they're kind of separate things. Would you guys agree? If you don't like the power fantasy stuff, I cannot disrecommend Peaky Blinders enough to you. <laughs> um, this is Peaky Blinders, a show I find really annoying. It has like a scene that I'll probably never forget, which is where the, the ladies of the main cast, they want to go on strike. Um, so they just have a scene where they get together and say, okay, let's go on strike. And then they walk out, um, of the, their building in slow motion while the smokestacks of Birmingham go off and they walk in a straight line. So it's like the fucking guardians of the galaxy shot while like the Arctic monkeys or something plays in the background. And I'm like, oh my God, when will this show end? Um, it's so indulgent and like, uh, well-intentioned cause like he's trying to depict like women's suffrage and stuff and that's all good and important, but just the way he goes about it, I find so, um, bordering on fetishistic, certainly corny. Um, but yeah, I do agree with you that it does take me out of it. Um, but you know, I'm sure there are different perspectives you could take to it. I dare say in this case, um, giving the powers of voodoo magic to the only black woman in the main cast, <laughs> the, 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 the optics were perhaps slightly questionable. I don't know. I feel, um, the, the bigger thing that I feel the whole thing kind of connects to, and also with the ending as well, is that something about the screenplay that maybe I wish was a bit different is that I find it has a tendency to really over literalize and explain stuff in, in verbose detail. Like the fact yeah. that at the end she literally says spirits past, present and future and actually calls them out individually by name. Like there, there's not much willingness to suggest stuff, leave room for our imaginations. It's very like every little detail has to be, you know, um, brought up directly. Like when, when Mary sees Scrooge hovering over Bob Cratchit's shoulder in episode three, you know, Lottie is like, well, sometimes when they have high emotions, they can technically see spirits so she can see you <laughs> technically but there, you know there's a reason for that and it's like like you know, we don't need to be told this all the time and i think the script in general has this really writerly habit i think of needing to make sure you understand every last thing it's doing to an almost repetitive degree like every metaphor like okay um there's gonna be pins and needles in scrooge's heart ah, and that was the first pin and the first <laughs> needle it's it gets it gets a bit repetitive in the sense of everything is to be rammed into your, into your head and it almost it almost comes off a bit like it was written as a okay it's, it's it's a bit unkind to say this it's not like it's an audiobook but there is a sense of like it, it's the, the 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 script the presence of the script the written text is domineering to a really serious degree and i feel you could make you could you could trim bits of it here and there and let the the other elements of the storytelling do the work and let our let our imaginations do a bit more work and i think maybe it contributes a bit to this idea of an oppressive tone that it has that some critics hated or whatever i i feel like it's maybe something that makes it a bit more awkward than it needed to be hmm I agree. I think it's one of the ways Knight probably could have been afforded to have been a little bit more like Dickens. It's just like give a little bit of rope to the audience, you know, and don't um, hammer things home so much. The one that really bothers me is um, in the orphanage when Lottie pulls the gun and then Scrooge says, 
she pulled a fucking gun. She's like a highwayman. <laughs> so it's basically he's turning to the camera saying, look, this is epic. She's doing an epic thing. Um, and I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, uh, this is like a Chris but... Chibnall edit. <laughs> I, I liked I liked that moment. I thought it was kind of wondrous for him to actually get a glimpse um, from the ghost of, you know, what a hero his sister was. But I see what you guys are saying. It is, it is yeah. fairly explicit. I love the story beat. I'm just not a yeah. fan of the line. Another way of looking at it is that it's just sort of um, the price to pay for such a, like you say, writerly script. Like, on the one hand, it is very writerly and you have things hammered home. But on the other hand, it's very writerly. And you have, like, yeah. actual proper scenes with a capital S where, um, you know, the characters... There are many instances where things aren't spelled out. Like, I think there's the office scene with Scrooge and Cratchit is the perfect example where there are so many unspoken things in that scene. Um, that's, like, textbook stuff. So... It's definitely not all bad, but at the same time, yeah, Stephen Knight is ultimately no Charles Dickens. I mean, Charles Dickens would never write fucking Serenity, if you've ever seen that. <laughs> Just before we move on, on that topic of things being spelled out and not spelled out, um, uh, the the thing that earlier on we, we someone mentioned and said it was mysterious is um, the, the element of Scrooge being presumably a, a survivor of childhood sexual abuse from that uh, schoolmaster. Mm. Right? And, that, and, that's, and that thing, I can't help but think, because... Because the show is being, I think, quite careful about tiptoeing around it and being tasteful in uh, depicting it, representing it, whatever, and sort of um, maybe walking on eggshells slightly, I think, weirdly, the effect that has on the overall uh, story is that the presence of something that huge, which I think I think is is kind of huge, to I think it's one of the biggest swings this adaptation takes is to suggest that Scrooge was, you know, a survivor of... Uh, of abuse of her sexual nature like as a child it's like it feels almost a bit minimized relative to what you might uh expect it, it's like it, we find out it's there in the second episode but then it's sort of it's sort of parked a little bit and obviously it's brought up again but it, it feels like it, it, in some elements the script is very you know verbose and very uh, forthcoming perhaps a bit too much and then in, in this element it's it's maybe like uh, holding an uncharacteristic amount back and maybe i maybe i feel the balance is maybe a bit uh, wonky i don't know i think yeah i think well it's that thing of how the series is really explicit in some scenes and implicit in others but i feel like the um obviously from the abuse we get the pathology of his inability to believe in humans being good and we also get his obsession with quantifying everything because he was quantified by his father that's how he came to be abused in the first place. And so we get the obsession with maths, the obsession with profit ventures and exchanges. Now we can quantify everything down into numbers. It seemed to me an outgrowth in how we could rationalize why he was abused in the first place. Why and how could such an evil be done to him? I feel like it all evolves from that in these kind of multifaceted ways. But we don't get him, you know, saying that to the camera uh, the way we do with some other scenes. And I feel like the abuse as well, it's... It's one of those things you put it on paper and people will scorn or sneer or like shout at the series because it's an absurd thing to like say this is the series where Scrooge gets, you know, sexually abused. It sounds just, you know, like a ridiculous comic story which injects, you know, Batman in prison. Yes, getting, it sounds you know, like whatever. someone trying to parody Zack Snyder, basically, <laughs> in a very bad faith manner. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I'm not saying um, anyone has to approve of how the series has done it or anything, but there's clearly a lot more going on here. It's not just like the edgy take on A Christmas Carol. It's a real attempt to unwrap Scrooge's psyche and, you know, develop a nuanced portrayal of this character uh, beyond just the stereotype. Yeah. And also just generally how, like, abuse perpetuates itself. Mm -hmm. um, it It never felt, yeah, like an exercise in edginess to me either. And one thing that I was really impressed with generally is how Scrooge is, for all we've talked about the fact that this version of Scrooge is more irredeemable than others, he was also um, quite sympathetic in a weird way. Like, it's because of, like, what Guy Pierce brings to it, I think. He just brings so much vulnerability and you actually do kind of feel for because he's just such a wreck of a human being and, like, He's able to convey the fact that, you know, he had positive relationships with his sister and, and things of that nature, but they've been lost now. And it's like the balancing act of he he's done horrible things, but he is also a human. And I think you need to be able to um, do those two things because that's important because, like, no one is entirely a monster. No one is entirely just justified because they have emotions. You need to reconcile that, that contradiction 
in order to make a sort of mature judgment of like where Scrooge is at in terms of the damage that he's done onto other people. They really foreground both in the writing and Pierce's performance that Scrooge is almost like a big child still, even as this old man. He gives us a very infantilized vibe in some of the ways that he is kind of trying to make excuses for himself. And and even the times where he's being super edgy and super callous and horrible, those in itself, those are also childish affectations in a way, like like, like, like a child's idea of what a, a badass cool person is like. Oh, I'm a scientist. You know, these, these ideas that are fundamentally very infantile, but, you know, obviously they're being done by an adult. It, it's, um, and the bit that I felt was really rammed home how human Scrooge felt was his final admission in the end when he says, you know, I would justify everything I've done according to the consequence. That that really that really hit that really hit home for me. It really it really struck a chord. There's something really honest and bruised and sad and poignant about that take and that interpretation of his character and when he just confesses that. It it really um the, 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 I think that's when he feels the most human, perhaps at that moment. And also, um Big, big question mark about like what does this version of Scrooge do after the credits roll? Um, there are a few ways it could go that I imagine, but um, I'm glad that they didn't show like his ultimate fate and they didn't show what he gets up to after this because it certainly presents a lot to think about. What did you guys think of the scene uh, after Scrooge just maybe had his um his epiphany or whatever, and he goes to the Cratchits and starts acting like like a bit of a madman? to them because obviously it's an analog to the scene that the equivalent scene in the original story and the other adaptations of it where he's a bit uh a bit uh woozy and delirious from his experience and he's trying to be all happy in the spirit of christmas and stuff whereas in this one it's got a slightly different tone to it because obviously he's intruding in a house where he is very much not welcome mary looks terrified she's you know shouting at him to leave but he's just he's insisting on intruding in there and saying things that make no sense to tim and just looking a bit like 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 he's just wandered in off the street like a total madman it's got it's, it's faintly disconcerting so what do you guys think about that that scene it sort of makes you think that he's going to go off and become like a monk or something or just hide yeah. away in argentina like how can this man sort of go on with himself um also, I must say, faintly doctorish, just the whole manic yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> raving element of it. But yeah, I mean, having Mary want him to leave and not forgiving him was the obvious and correct choice. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure it was the right note to strike, I think, having him be a bit weird. Because I always felt that at the end of the novella, when he embraces the spirit of Christmas, you you were never really fully convinced by that. Um mm. And it's why the scene in this where he practices in the mirror saying like, oh, Merry Christmas, everybody, is so great. Because that's always kind of how I felt about Scrooge in the book is that like he's he's had the spirit of Christmas shocked into him. It's a burst of adrenaline. So like, sure, he's going to be kind now, but what about the morning after and the morning after that and after that? Um, you know, is he a man whose soul has been saved or is he a guy who just had a gun to his head and he's just scared about damnation? Um this version I felt was a lot more real where maybe that sort of manic desperation is more on the surface rather than implied. So I was a fan of the way that was staged. I like that regarding the whole ending and Scrooge at the end, his actions and what he does there, it, it feels so, it's so small and, yeah. you know, gritty. And, you know, he, at the end of the day, he, he scatters some gravel on, on a pond, on a frozen pond. You know, he doesn't you know, change the world and he's there per, per se. The fact that they, they kind of deflate some, the, the idea of some grand, epic narrative for Scrooge. It's very small. It's very human. It's very just this one guy, uh, you know, doing, the best he can and it feels truer in that way just the way that they scale everything down it's he can't bring the ponies back he can't bring any people back he can't go and change anything in the past that's why he's so understanding is forgiveness can't happen all that really happened is i now understand you know being a human being it's all it's like you're contextualizing him as a child it's just like he grew up a little bit he, he couldn't save anything beyond you know a possible timeline for tiny tim I love how it makes it small because otherwise, you know, it's this, it, it, it's vaunting, you know, rich people, um, the other way to do it because it's still focusing on their power and their individualistic ability and, you know, how they, if we could just make them good, then that's, you know, fantastic, you know, that these people are great because they can share that greatness around. I love this, how it shrinks it down because he is a small man. Uh, yeah, I think, I think a small ending was the way, the way to go. 
And I love the little moment of how he tries to extend dignity to Cratchit by shaking his hand. But it's like, it's not, it's not all working. <laughs> like, Mary clearly just wants him out. Tim is just, you know, is this guy, you know, on laudanum? Like, I don't really understand. He's just kind of amused. It's not going the way you want this scene to go. You know, the Scrooge being happy scene. But it's going the way, you know, that makes sense for this series. And again, I think it's one of the reasons a lot of people dislike this series. It's because it's robbing them of the joy of A Christmas Carol. It's yeah. robbing them of that joyful catharsis. But that's kind of the point. Is this adaption is looking at how bad this time and this person was. So you can't deflate that by making everything good in the end. Although if it's robbing them the joy of A Christmas Carol, um, that moment when I think he's in the present sequence and he hears the singing from the church of the people who's... um who were hurt in the mine. It, that that was giving me kind of all the Who's down in Whoville were singing vibes. <laughs> <laughs> He's kind of transplanting it for a different Christmas story altogether. One more one more thing that struck me. Um, in that first episode, they talk about religion and God a bit, and Scrooge is established as this atheistic non-believer, and he compares the story of Christ to that of Alibaba in the sense of being mm. fictional. And that's a really good setup because what we get in episode two is an exploration of how the story of Alibaba was so empowering and so helpful yes. to Scrooge. So that is an implicit rebuke of his derision towards faith and religion earlier on. So you even get that little kind of rebuke of the whole edgy atheist milady fedora <laughs> mindset as well baked and in there. His, his issue with christianity is it's an issue i see with a lot of atheists that really dislike christianity is his issue is well you know jesus wasn't born in december uh you know it can't snow in palestine therefore mm, your religion is wrong it's like you you're totally missing the you're not you're not really perceiving anything you know by doing that you're seizing on these tiny little logical gaps that have nothing to do with why any Christians are Christian, you know, or why people celebrate Christmas. It's just this, hmm, I have logic to you, therefore I am superior and I understand the world and you're failing to, you know, it's that total uh, ridiculous logic of his. Yeah. And this guy doesn't even know that it was actually just co-opting like the winter solstice yeah, celebration. Like there is a logic to why it is in December. It's Look at the top of his head. <laughs> um, and it's the, uh, the whole like yeah the whole image of camels in the snow is like a it's a boiling down of the idea that um not everything has to fit into scrooge's grand logic you know there is sort of the right kind of magic where it's just going by instinct and yeah love effectively and that was an, a, sort of something which could have been spelled out into like a tortured metaphor um but thankfully wasn't yeah i guess i could spend more time praising like the visual style Oh yeah, Nick Murphy. Yeah, um, he said he was inspired by a Dutch painter, Wilhelm Hammershoy, who yeah he does these like very sparse sort of austere interiors with like people facing away from the viewer. And there were a couple shots, well more than a couple. There were a few shots um, in this mini series that are like that with the 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 figure trained away from the viewer. And um, the one the one that stuck out to me was like in the office scene where Scrooge is, says that Cratchit's eyes are like daggers and you just see the back of Scrooge's head and he's just like completely, you know, hiding from our gaze. And also Guy Pierce is so upstaged by the back of his own head, like that, <laughs> that spiky white hair. I think it looks amazing. And yeah, just everything down to the costumes and um, the set design is so meticulous. And yeah, we spend so much time in these houses that, and then you never get sick of them. Um, and that, and they're so empty somehow. It's all like dictated by light and just empty negative space. It's very like r slash ideal male living space to to bring it back, <laughs> back to another subreddit. But um, yeah, just incredible to to look at. So yeah, petition petitioning for a Blu-ray release, um, as I'm sure you would mirror. Yeah, it's visually gorgeous, and it's just so refreshing to get a version of this story that plays up the horror and just has spooky shit happening, like Marley's jaw falling off or. And oh, just, that was just so gross. It in, yeah, just, and just immersing it in just the, the darkness and just terror, because it, it feels like other versions maybe want to go there a bit. And you know, even Muppet Christmas Carol is famous for the ghost of Christmas future being kind of this creepy Grim Reaper thing. But, you know, it seems like because it's a wholesome Christmas story, they can never actually do that. So it's really nice to get one that just goes full tilt and just makes it damn creepy. To close things down now, I'll just comment on two meta things about the production. The first is originally Tom Hardy was going to be in the series uh, because he's part of the production company that made the series with Stephen Knight, showrunner of Peaky Blinders, who showran this as well. What role do you guys think Tom Hardy would have played? Um, Papa Scrooge is where my money's going. Hmm. Because 
I'm not familiar with the actor who did play Papa Scrooge. I think he was in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, possibly other things. But um, to me, he just looks like a very Tom Hardy type, you know, the sort of intense gaze, bearded, square jawed. And it's such a big role that, and the way they build up to his entrance, it would feel so appropriate to have it be like, oh my God, it's Tom Hardy. And Tom Hardy would bring so much intensity to that. Uh, the only other one I can think of is Ghost of Christmas Past, because I think it's not hard to go from like gruff Andy Circus to gruff Tom Hardy. Oh yeah. But I'm willing to wager that it might've been the Scrooge's dad. I was thinking Ghost of Christmas Future, just because it's that classic Tom Hardy thing of, he, it's just acting with the eyes, you know, it's like Bane or- Mad Max, where there's little dialogue or no dialogue, but it's just eye acting. Gig do of a different take. Yeah, but he wouldn't get to do a silly voice. Because, um, <laughs> That's true. Because the future's mouth is sewn up. I mean, see, I wonder if just because, just because the the degree to which Tom Hardy maybe transforms and does strange roles that you wouldn't quite expect, I wonder if he might have just been Scrooge and just had yeah, that silly very hair. <laughs> yeah, straight up. I mean, something something <laughs> Stephen Knight said actually in some interview is that um, I know you said earlier, someone said earlier that Scrooge is like an old man, he doesn't have long for this world. But Stephen Knight actually intentionally didn't want to do the traditional old decrepit Scrooge. You know, he cast a, I mean, you know, Guy Pearce is not exactly as old as the Scrooges that we're maybe used to. Like a, a slightly more uh just sort of middle aged Scrooge was sort of what they were going for. So I could I could maybe see it. I don't know. It really just depends. You don't want Scrooge to be silly. I think that's the main thing. Yeah. yeah. One last question is well Stephen Knight has said he wants to adapt more Dickens novels uh for television in the coming years. What Dickens story would you like him to do next? I believe Russell T. Davies has already nabbed the old Curiosity Shop. Um, he has. I think I saw Armando Iannucci's David Copperfield last year, and it was a nice watch for sure, but it really amped up like the twee aspects of Dickens. So as a sort of tonic to that, I wouldn't mind seeing Knight do the, do the Christmas Carol treatment for David Copperfield. Which is kind of a strange to say, considering we got one so recently. But like, that's my reasoning. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll go with the easy, boring answer and just say Oliver Twist, just because it's so it's so universally famed as that wholesome Dickens story. So let's go for the iconoclasm. Let's have another one that gets a mediocre rating of Rotten Tomatoes because people hate it so much for ruining a classic story. Go for it, you know. Yeah, and I would like to see Knight <laughs> reassess some of the politics in A Tale of Two Cities. I'd be very curious if you tried to flip any of that on its head.